Live from Case at 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. He dedicated his life to the community and cracking down on the very crime that investigators say took his life. Tonight, friends and former colleagues of retired Converse Assistant Police Chief Rodney Rex Reiner spoke about the legacy he leaves behind after being killed by a suspected drunk driver. Our Devin Clark with our top story. He was a fun guy to be around. He, he was very, very uh, knowledgeable on everything. Rodney Reiner, known affectionately as Rex, was also said to be a by-the-books policeman. 27 years on the job was more than enough time for him to make a huge impact on those he came in contact with. He started as a police officer, worked himself all the way up to assistant chief, very involved with the community, Eagle Scout, FBI Academy graduate. Inspiring colleagues seem to be part of Reiner's job with the Converse Police Department before retiring in March of 2017. He encouraged me to continue on with my training and education and how important it would be. A trusted voice heavily relied on by Converse city leaders. He was the only person I allowed to speak for me because I knew that uh, he'd do right. Around 9 o'clock last night, San Antonio police say that the SUV Reiner was in was struck by a woman in her 20s named Jean Nicole Bernice Coutros. The crash happening on Nacogdoches near O'Connor when SAPD says Coutros sped off after being pulled over for driving erratically. She's now charged with intoxication manslaughter and evading arrest and detention with a vehicle. Those charges pointing to a sadly ironic ending to Reiner's life. And he would tell you, there is, no, there is no guarantee tomorrow. Do everything that you possibly can today. And so for it to end this way is exactly what he meant. Reiner was in his late 50s. He leaves behind two sons and two grandchildren. We understand that flags will be lowered to half staff until his funeral, which will include a police and fire department procession. Reporting in the newsroom, Devin Clark, KSAT 12 News. New changes to how the quarantine at JBSA Lackland will work as the Grand Princess cruise ship passengers come in. We are now learning Lackland could soon be a quarantine for Texans only. Garrett Berger live at Kelly Field to explain. Garrett. Last night, 98 passengers from the Grand Princess cruise ship landed here at Kelly Field. 91 of them Texans already. Now, just over an hour ago, citing a phone conversation with the U.S. Health and De Department of Health and Human Services official, the mayor's office says there will be more flights over the next day or two with Texans and non-Texans alike as the, as the federal government reshuffles the evacuees around. The mayor's office said in a statement partly, quote, Dr. Cadlick, that HHS official, conveyed that the goal is to consolidate all Texans at Lackland and to transport the non-Texans to their home states. By moving evacuees to their home states, this will begin to level the obligation for all communities as each prepares for potential community spread. Now, this comes just a few hours after we learned non-Texan quarantine patients would not be sent to the Texas Center for Infectious Disease anymore, the state-run facility where those who tested positive for the virus had been going. The governor's office sending a, go a spokesman for Governor Greg Abbott sending us a statement reading partly, quote, Governor Abbott has been assured that no one who is not a Texan will be released to a local or state health facility so as not to take away resources from Texans who have or may contract the coronavirus or are dealing with other health issues. The spokesman also confirmed that had been at Abbott's request. Now, the city is preparing for a possible outbreak of its own, though there have been no cases of community transition of transmission of the novel coronavirus here so far. Metro health officials say they are ready to test for the virus, though they will only be doing that for patients who meet certain criteria. Live at Kelly Field, I'm Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. The coronavirus giving college students here at San Antonio at least one more week of spring break. The Alamo Colleges, Texas A&M San Antonio, UTSA, Trinity University, and St. Mary's University all announcing campuses will be closed for at least one more week to prepare for the coronavirus. As of today, classes for all of these colleges and universities are expected to resume on March 23rd. UTSA and Texas A&M San Antonio say at that point all classes will be taught online. St. Mary's University says it is preparing staff to possibly do the same. As for Our Lady of the Lake and Incarnate Word, according to their websites, they are monitoring the virus, but at this point have not announced any changes. Trinity also asking students not to return to their dorms 
unless it's to pick up their belongings. A student can file an exemption if they have nowhere to go. Meanwhile, CPS Energy today saying that for the time being, it will not be cutting off power to people who fall behind on payments because of concerns about paying their bills in person due to COVID-19. Mayor Ron Nirenberg and the San Antonio City Council supporting this move. CPS Energy reminds customers there are many ways to make your payments, including by mail, by phone or online. They're also available to respond to non bill related issues, either by phone or online as well. You can find more information about your options posted on our website at ksat.com. As the coronavirus continues to spread, a lot of things are changing very fast from the number of people who have COVID-19 to the number of events that have been affected. We are keeping track of all of it right now on ksat.com. That's where you can find the latest information on cancellations, closures, and what you need to know to make sure you and your family are doing what you need to do to stay safe. We are putting it all right there on our homepage again at ksat.com. New at six with the state seeking the death penalty for accused cop killer Otis McCain, jury selection, which is now underway, becomes more complex. McCain is accused in the execution style shooting of veteran SAPD detective Ben Marconi. Paul Venema takes a look at how jury selection is conducted in death penalty cases. Both prosecutors and defense attorneys are in the process of reviewing questionnaires completed by 200 potential jurors in the capital murder case of Otis McCain. The next step, the lawyers and McCain will meet here with individual prospective jurors to review their questionnaire. They give you an insight into the thoughts uh, and views of the panel members before they come to court. The stakes here are as high as they get since prosecutors are seeking the death penalty. McCain is accused of shooting veteran SAPD detective Ben Marconi to death as Marconi sat in his patrol car. Both the state and the defense team have identical definitions of what they're looking for in a juror. So someone that can be open-minded, that can really be open-minded and doesn't have extreme views on either end. Their job as a juror could be complex. If they convict McCain, they'll have to consider two special issues. The special issues are very technical and you really, really have to explain it to them. Those issues are, is the defendant a future danger to society? And are there any mitigating circumstances that dictate that the death penalty not be enforced? If the answer to each question is no, the sentence is execution. If one question is answered yes, it's life in prison without the possibility of parole. Interviewing prospective jurors, which normally takes about a day or two in most cases, is expected to last at least a month. Obviously, there's still a lot of work to be done before a jury takes their place here, but at this point, it looks as though that'll happen on the 27th of next month. Paul Venema, KSAT 12 News. Tonight, the Bear County Republican Party is doing what local Democratic Party did last night, canvassing the results of the 2020 primary. Then tomorrow, the elections office will post the official results on its website. Yet at one point, the GOP chair added a bit of drama by saying she didn't trust the results and said they should be thrown out. Jesse Degollado says the chance of that has been described by a political scientist as vanishingly small. After telling Bear County commissioners about alleged discrepancies in the 2020 primary, local Republican Party chair Cynthia Bream later would say, We don't certify it. You don't have an election. What are you going to do? Throw it out. Not so, according to the Texas Election Code. It states the county chair shall canvass the precinct election returns. And if Bream doesn't, the code goes on to say the state chair may perform any administrative duty of the county chair. As far as throwing out the results, of a primary? Have other elections met the same fate? I'm not aware of any uh, that I've seen in recent history or and I have <laughs> no knowledge of even distant history. Other than technical glitches that delayed consolidating the results for hours, Crockett says he's not aware of anything that would warrant starting over. I can't imagine a situation that would provoke that barring uncovering some sort of malfeasance. <laughs> as in wrongdoing, especially by a public official. Even then, now that a record quarter of a million people in Bear County have cast their ballots, throwing those out, Crockett says, would anger voters. Probably directed at the people who are actually agitating for this. After all, he says the nation has fought to protect the fundamental right to vote, considered sacred by many. So to have that messed with is 
uh, not a wise course of action. Well, even then, the Secretary of State's office tells me that decision would be up to a judge. Also, the chair of the state Republican Party, James Dickey, says after speaking to Brim, he doesn't have any reason to believe she won't certify the results. In the newsroom, Jesse Degollado, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Jesse. Time saver traffic now. Let's take a look at a pretty significant backup here. This is the camera view at Loop 410 at Ingram. This is the eastbound lanes where you're seeing the big tie up here, all because of an accident right here at the on ramp at Zhang's Lane. 410 and Ingram, that's the camera view, but definitely nobody going anywhere quickly on those main eastbound lanes of 410, really, as well as uh, the access road there off to the side. New at six, a domestic violence survivor telling her story in an innovative way, catching the attention of agencies like SAPD and the city's health department. Courtney Friedman spoke to Karen Chatham about why she's using her tough experience as a platform to discuss issues like abuse, mental health and HIV. It's part of Courtney's series confronting domestic violence called Loving in Fear. In this house, we like a flock of birds. These characters are in a play, but their words and stories are very real. The play, Karen Chatham's Hurting Became a Habit, was written by Karen herself. She was married to her abuser for 23 years. I was open to that because I was still dealing with the hurt from being a kid that was surviving molestation. As part of her recovery, she started an organization called We Speak on Purpose. I write to bring attention to social issues most people won't talk about comfortably in their own home. So we on purpose go out and we speak about family violence, survival, we talk about mental health, and we talk about HIV. This weekend, she and her cast will perform the play at UIW with the support of countywide organizations including SAPD's Crisis Response Team and Metro Health's HIV Prevention Team. After the play is over and people are all emotional and they're like, oh my God, I'm going through that and I didn't know what to do or who to speak to, we connect them with the person and link them into care. Get them tested right there. What does this issue look like? Metro Health Violence Prevention Manager Jenny Hickson says all these health issues are interconnected. People who are HIV positive, that sometimes that disclosure in and of itself can be the start of a violent episode. We also know that people who are in relationships that they're experiencing violence, oftentimes can't negotiate safe sex. There is life after a storm. Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. And you can see the play for free this Saturday and Sunday at 3 p.m. at the UIW Maybe Library Auditorium. Again, services and resources will be provided right there on the spot. Parental discretion is advised. Taking a live look outside with live cam on this Wednesday, halfway through spring break for some. Maybe it'll be longer, we don't know. But the sun returned today, and it was a beautiful day to be out and about. If you had yeah, a beautiful day out and about. A lot of sunshine, temperatures climbing into the mid to even upper 90s. The aquifer, upper 80s rather, the aquifer is down two tenths of a foot over the past 24 hours. Oak is now high on the pollen count. That's going to be on everybody's mind because we'll really start to wheeze and sneeze from those oak trees. I'll be back with a look at the forecast. We're talking rain chances coming up.